Good evening. Welcome everyone to the Union County Board of Education, February 2nd, 2021, open session meeting. I would like to begin um, with um, letting everyone know that Reverend Bench, uh, Reverend, <laughs> Reverend Benchin, Reverend Vic Weaver cannot be with us tonight. He and his wife um, are at home. And um, so we are going to all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And that brings us to, to the approval of the agenda. I move that we approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kathy Hintail for the John H. Crowder Service Award. You want me to do it from here or up there? It's your choice. You can do it wherever you're. Look official up there. Good evening, everyone. The late John H. Crowder spent more than 30 years serving the children of Union County. As a living tribute, tribute to him and his legacy, the Union County Board of Education awards the John H. Crowder Service Award every month to an outstanding high school student who is making a difference in their school and community. Students who receive this award are not only academically successful, but also have an established history of community service. Due to social distancing guidelines, we are sharing these awards virtually. The winners will be recognized through a special online tribute that will be posted on the UCPS website and social media pages. Tonight, we award the John H. Crowder Service Award for February to a junior at Weddington High School who works continuously to serve her school and community. Arshia pa Pal revamped the Weddington High School chapter of the Key Club. Working diligently during an international pandemic, Arshia grew the membership of this service-oriented student organization to over 70 members in just one semester. Under Arshia's leadership, the Key Club members organized a coat drive for the local community, contributed to the Merch of Dimes, hosted a teacher's luncheon, organized a winter teacher's gift, facilitated a school supply drive, and hosted a virtual training on how to make dog toys to, do to donate to local pets shelters. Arshia's extensive community service efforts truly highlights how she works to make a difference at Weddington High School and in the community as a whole. She works tirelessly to bridge the two by providing an outlet for students to give back through community service while growing efforts at Weddington High School during a time when so many are struggling. Arshia's positive ed energy is a beacon of hope for students and staff at Weddington High School. She is the epitome of what this award stands for. Board members, please join me in congratulating Arshia Pal as the February 2021 recipient of the John H. Crowder Award. Thank you. That brings us to public comments. And we have several signed up tonight. 30 minutes has been allotted for public comments. Community members wishing to speak during public comments should state their name, address, and phone number prior to, make, prior to making other comments. The board will not hear in open session complaints about the performance of school personnel, personnel issues, or confidential student issues. Individuals may address the board for a maximum of three minutes. Any person who is appointed representative for a group may address the board for five minutes. 
Should a community member wish to seek information or share items that may not be shared during public comments, our staff are available to address your concerns or provide information. Dr. Brad Breedlove, Chief Academic Officer, is with us tonight, along with Dr. Bashan Harris, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, and Jared McCraw, Assistant Superintendent of Student Services, are here to assist. Our first speaker tonight is Mr. Gilbert Spears. So, yeah. okay. All right. Good evening. Dr. Houlihan, board members and cabinet members. My name is Gilbert Spears and I reside at 14325 Northridge Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28269. My phone number is 704-906-3481. I'm a, a board liaison for the Union County Association of Educators, of which the president is Pamela Carlton and the vice president is Elena Brown. On behalf of the Union County Association of Educators, I'd like to thank you for your time this evening and for your willingness to listen and offer advice to our fellow educators throughout the county. We realize that you are charged with the responsibility of making tough decisions through this pandemic that affects the entire community, and we know that this cannot be easy for you. We all have, to have, we all have had to face many challenges and decisions in the past year that we never would have dreamed of. First, we would like to thank you for ensuring that employees over 50 were able to get the COVID vaccine. And we are excited for the rest of our staff to have the opportunity to receive the vaccine as soon as possible. We would also like to thank you for keeping Friday as a remote day for all students and providing teachers and staff a much needed day to meet with small groups of students or one-on-one, -on -one, attend PLC meetings, EC meetings, and for many teachers plan for in-person and virtual instruction. That takes a tremendous amount of time and thought. This has been absolutely vital to our success during this time. There are some concerns among our staff that we'll discuss, and for the sake of this evening, I will stick to the main points of each problem, each concern rather. We have some concerns raised about decorations in teachers' classrooms that are controversial and contain racist or white supremacist imagery. What is the policy for the paraphernalia in classrooms that are deemed inappropriate by other staff or students? Can that policy please be distributed to every staff member and administrator? The new COVID variants are in our area and leading epidemiologists are warning that the next six to eight weeks will be, de will be devastation like we've never seen before. Please continue to watch the numbers and continue that these strains are much more contagious than the strain we have just started to understand. Can you provide teachers who are face to face with K9, 90, KN95 masks in order for them to feel safe around students and other adults? Our teachers and staff have operated under the fullest extent of in-person instruction as the state orders allow for since August 17th. We are the largest district in the state that has remained open throughout the entire school year. We have worked tirelessly and our teachers deserve a raise and bonus. We ask that you request that the county commissioners provide employees with a local subsidy increase and or bonus compensation for our extra work this year under difficult circumstances. Next, I have some information that has been researched in reference to COVID. Many BOE members, as well as our own governor, are still quoting data from the Duke study that was conducted early last fall before the metrics skyrocketed. Newer findings suggest that there may be an undercount of the actual number of children infected, and more cases in children have been detected recently. Newer findings suggest that younger children may be able to spread the virus more than originally thought. Children can get COVID and can contribute to community spread by taking it back to their households. Is UCPS considering this? Many local government officials have posted a Washington Post article from January 26 titled, CDC finds scant spread of coronavirus in schools with precautions in place, but it failed to read closely the requirements needed to take, make the title of this article true. At this point, the conditions stated in this article are not being met in Union County or North, or North Carolina. Therefore, schools cannot be considered safe places until precautions such as regular screening tests, increased air ventilation, and maintaining six feet of distance are in place. 
In that same Washington Post article, CDC researchers said they were particularly concerned about indoor sports and other extracurricular activities that do not allow for distancing and mask use. Uh, UCPS is currently operating all sports, even the ones considered uh, high contact slash risk. By choosing to have these sports operating, we are once again adding to the risk in our schools. Teachers and students eat lunch inside classrooms daily with masks off. In elementary schools, the children are at most three feet distance from one another. This would automatically require any class to be quarantined if a teacher or a student in that class tests positive in an elementary school. Uh, why isn't this happening consistently? Elementary schools are directed to distance three feet away from, each, from one another. Many people who, ha who should have been quarantined were asked if they were within three feet of the infected person for exposure purposes. However, according to the Strong Schools Toolkit, exposure is considered, is considered being within six feet of someone who has COVID-19 for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or more. Since it is impossible to social distance six feet in plan A, all elementary students and teachers would need to be quarantined if a student or teacher within a classroom test positive. Sounds up. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Angela McCauley. take off my glasses so that it, they don't fog up, so please forgive me. And thank you for this opportunity. On January 20, oh, I'm Angela McAuley, sorry, 1605 Fuller Drive, Monroe, North Carolina, 28112, phone number 704-307-8490. I'm a proud Benton Heights second grade teacher. On January 28, 1986, I was in sixth grade. We watched the space shuttle launch and then tragically explode. I didn't know to ask why. We later found out that there was a dangerous issue with the solid rocket boosters. NASA had this data and took a calculated risk. It didn't go well. I wonder if, if that data had been shared with those astronauts, including a teacher, would they have made the same decision to climb aboard? We have a right to know how you decide about the risks we take. Now I am a teacher. I live and breathe data, and so do our students. I create action steps and determine which specific data to use in my data decision making. But when data isn't transparent, lack of understanding creates confusion, and right now, serious concern. I have asked for transparency and correspondence to the Professional Advisory Council, known as PAC, UCPS, and the Board of Education, I've even searched for my own answers in the Strong Schools Toolkit and the Lighting Our Way Forward document. I have followed the data on the Union County dashboard since the beginning. I was left wondering what data UCPS uses specifically and how they use this data to make operational decisions. And the latest PAC minutes indicate that 11 other schools had the same questions. I thank Mr. McCraw for sharing some insightful information with me yesterday but I've noticed a discrepancy. In the months of November to January, what data was used to determine that our metrics were, quote, stable or moving in a positive direction, as stated in the Strong Schools Toolkit? My request for you today is that you be transparent and specific with the data you collect and how you make operational decisions with that data. I also request that you fully inform the public now on how COVID is truly impacting our schools with absences due to quarantine, total number of cases, including impactful cases. Only one impactful case reported on the UCPS dashboard isn't why my school was put on Plan C for one week. The informed reason is this. My school had 55 students and staff who were either positive, quarantined, or awaiting test results. I can only imagine that this is happening all over our county. I know two things. Being in school is what's best for kids. Governor Cooper said the exact same thing today. I also know this. The adults, us, in the schools are beyond weary, anxious, and concerned for the physical and emotional health of our students, school family, our own families, and ourselves. What led me here tonight was the death of another Union County educator. I knew him, and Ken is irreplaceable. Thank you, Ms. McCauley. Thank you. 
Our next, next speaker is Paige Haney. Hi, my name is Paige Haney. I reside at 3304 Savannah Way, Monroe 28110. My number is 704-650-8608. I'd like to thank you all for serving on this board. I know this has been a horrible year and uh, it's much appreciated. I am here to seek your help with recent policy changes to the CATA lottery. Um, charter school students, private school students, and homeschool students are being omitted from the first CATA lottery this year and the second CATA lottery this year, which means typically there's about 500 people to enter the lottery for 220 spaces. And with all of those kids out of the lottery, once all of the current UCPS students are placed, if there's any scraps left over, they will be given to the other children. We purchased a house in Union County. This was not the case. We looked at Mecklenburg, Cabarrus. They offered early college, middle college, career-based education, IB programs. And we chose Union County because the lottery process was fair and equal. And we felt like we had a sincere shot at getting our kids in. And my daughter successfully did make it into CATA. And she's an honor student and a junior there now. When we voted this fall for the board members, it was also the process was fair and equal. When I filled out the application on January 4th at 7 p.m., none there was no mention of this anywhere. The policy appeared to be the same as it had always been for the last decade. When I reached out to a school guidance counselor that evening because I couldn't find the prerequisite requirements, uh, sometimes you have to have certain EOG scores and that type of thing for engineering programs. Um, she was kind enough to, at 8 p.m. that day, send me the new requirements, which were not uploaded at that time, that showed that my son will be excluded from this lottery. I don't think he should be punished or the other homeschool or charter school kids should be punished for this. When reaching out, asking what we should do, the only thing we were told by the attorney was that they recommended we pull our children out of school in the middle of a pandemic year and put them in public school. And that's the only way they can get a fair and equal chance at this lottery. Am I allowed to ask for a show of hands who thinks that's best for our children? Thank you. I'm asking the board who is in charge of this decision and I'm not getting a response but I'm hoping that you can help us and that you can advocate for us to make this a fair and equal for all Union County residents. We're all taxpayers, we're all voters, and we're really hopeful that you will come to our aid. Um, and if, if there's you know, reasons that that can't happen, if you would allow dual enrollment for our children, my son would gladly go to two schools this year and he can remote into both of them so that we can fit the requirements to receive a fair an equal chance at this lottery. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Quentin Haney. Hello, my name is Quentin Haney and I go to Union Academy and I'm in the eighth grade. My sister goes to CATA and praises the school a lot. So I've been very excited to go for it for many years now. On top of that, I love computers and was very interested in cybersecurity courses that CATA provides. So when I figured out that charter school students like Union Academy won't get a fair chance at the lottery, I was crushed. I can't think of any reason that this decision would be made because it directly works against your goals of making the lottery as fair as possible and making CATA more accessible to eh, making CATA more accessible as a school. Uh, I don't know why I'm being punished. I am an A student and I don't know why I don't get a fair chance like everyone else. Uh, I hope that you could rethink your decision because I know many kids at Union Academy have been waiting to go to CATA and just like me, their hopes are crushed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Quentin. Next is Ashley Burris. Hi, I'm Ashley Burris. I reside at 407 Water Lemon Way, Monroe, North Carolina, 28110. And my phone number is 
Um, I'm also here to talk about the cattle lottery. Um, I don't want to reiterate what's already been said, but as an educator, um, I feel that asking our students to switch schools mid-year is not in their best interest. And had we been told this policy was planning on changing, I'm sure we all would have agreed to put our kids into Union County Schools. Um, Union County Schools are a great school system. I um, have nothing against them. Uh, however, when we moved here, I wanted to make sure all my kids went to the same school, no matter if we had to move from one place to the other um, within the county. Um, I also uh, wanted to say that as a taxpayer, all students should get the right to go. Um, we got, all of us got into this profession as educators to provide a, as good of an education as possible for all students. And I feel that by making the lottery so that it's only for UCPS schools uh, students, uh, is not giving all the students the best education that they could be getting. Um, so thank you for your time, and I hope that you really reconsider and truly think about the implications of this uh, decision. Thank you. Glasses don't fall good, but... <laughs> I'm Melanie Ray. I reside at 2420 Lancaster Highway in Monroe, 28112. My phone number is 704-287-7875. I would also like to speak about the cattle lottery changes for this year. We moved to Union County in 2002 for a school from a school system that was very chaotic and unstable. When it was time for our first child to begin school, we felt UA was a good option for us based on the fact that we wouldn't have to worry about where we lived in the county and any potential redistricting. This was a big problem where we moved from. We've moved several times within the county and we're thankful we didn't have to change schools. When it was time for high school, we felt a new experience would be beneficial to our kids in making the transition from high school to college. We felt this was important for their growth as most students have to adapt to a new environment and make new connections for high school just like we did growing up. We chose CADA for the variety of academies offered and the opportunity to explore potential career interests. We have two daughters that have attended CADA and they came from UA. Our girls were able to develop and excel due to their exposure to a combination of arts and academic rigor. Because of their commitment to this way of learning, we believe CADA is, a very, good, is very good at developing a well-rounded student. Our son has dreamed of being able to have a chance for that same experience in one of CADA's computer technology academies. You can imagine how devastated he was to learn of the change, that the change was made this year to the lottery. This change makes it impossible for charter, private, and homeschool students in Union County to have the same equal opportunity as their peers. I feel it's the board's duty to look out for the best interest of all students, regardless of where they currently attend school. This is actually stated in the board's policy manual for school assignment. We've asked multiple people within the school board for an explanation to help us understand why this change was made. Board members we spoke to were not even aware of the change and others stated they did not know why the change was made. We have no explanation to give our children as to why UCPS will be given our, as to why UCPS students will be given priority over them. Sorry. In lieu of any explanation, I was advised that I could pull my son out of his current school and enroll him in his district school to be immediately eligible for this priority status. I feel this was extremely insensitive to suggest, especially during the most difficult school year. And if the reason is that our kids would take the spots of current Union County kids, can we not make a cluster that's just for homeschool, charter school, and private school kids. In the past, we were put into our assigned cluster, and that's how it was done for my daughters. So I don't know if that's the reason, because nobody can give us a reason. 
So we're hoping that the school board and the superintendent can see how unfair and discouraging this is to the Union County students that this affects and reverse the change to give all students an equal opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Thank you. Our next speaker is Landon Ray. Hello, my name is Landon Ray and I am currently attending Union Academy and in the eighth grade. I have been waiting for about seven years to apply for CATA and was hoping for a fair chance to get in. I understand that UA is seen as a good school, but is, it does not have the avenues that I would need to pursue the career that I want. Students at Union Academy and other homeschool and private, private school students are no different from students enrolled in UCPS schools. I find it extremely unfair that you would give UCPS students an advantage over charter private and homeschool students in a lottery-based entry. I can't seem to find a reason that this decision would be made and I ask you to please rethink your decision now that you have an opinion from one of the students that your decision is affecting. Thank you for your time. That concludes public comments for tonight. And that brings us to open session meeting minutes for January 12th, 2021. I move that we approve the minutes from the January 12th meeting. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Very good. Eight O's. And that brings us to the consent agenda. I trust everyone here has um, read all of these from our committees. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Eight O. That brings us to the superintendent's report, Dr. Houlihan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone, and I um, hope everyone is doing well. I have several items tonight to report on. Uh, the first one is we are all aware of the, uh, as you've heard tonight, of the uh, press conference today by Governor Cooper and state leaders to encourage all public schools to reopen. Uh, with this announcement today, I'd like to reassure the public and Board of Education that we are in alignment with that recommendation and have been in alignment with that recommendation since day one of this school year to offer parents an option for in-person or virtual classes. There is no change currently for UCPS. Elementary schools will remain on plan A and middle and high schools will remain on plan B until the state announces a change. With the board's support and leadership, we have been and continue to be the largest school district offering this option for families and I continue to be extremely proud of all of our efforts and I appreciate the board's support on that. Uh, it is time for kindergarten registration, and we want to give a big welcome to the class of 2034. Oh. <laughs> Online enrollment is now open, and parents can register through Scribbles. You crazy? can access the portal via the UCPS website. Schools will hold virtual parent information sessions, sessions beginning this month, Parents, please visit your school's website for, or follow them on social media for updates. Also, we will have a Facebook Live Connect and Chat series with a kindergarten information session on Thursday, February 11th at 6.30 p.m. We are joining school districts across the nation this week to celebrate our school counselors. Um, I'd like to ask and everyone stop for a moment, whether you're here or at home, and let's give all of our counselors a big round of applause. We want you to know that we appreciate you and that you are valuable members of Team UCPS. The theme for this year is All In for Students. Please check out our school websites and social media pages for tributes and video messages to honor our school counselors. It's also Love the Bus Month. It's February, and that means it's time to love the bus. Next week, February 8th through 12th, is School Bus Driver Appreciation Week. As you know, our bus, our bus drivers are critical to the success of our operation. And again, we appreciate each of you as well as all of our transportation department. We know that it has been a very rough year, but we want to say thank you for hanging in there and, and doing all that you can to make sure our kids get to and from school in a safe manner. I'm also excited to announce that our Wayfind program is still going strong. As a reminder, we partnered with Wingate University three years ago to provide a college access program for middle and high school students. 
Through this partnership, eligible students can earn a full scholarship to Wingate University. Uh, next Monday, we will induct 40 new scholars. Uh, I believe that's 20 from last year, 20 from this year because of the pandemic when it hit. Um, these students are all currently at East Union and Monroe Middle Schools. And I want to thank the Wayfind team, Dr. Rhett Brown, for your leadership and our middle school administrators for their commitment to this program. And I believe the board has been invited to that virtual ceremony. And finally, next week, we will name the 2021 Teacher of the Year finalist. A team of staff and board members will surprise these special teachers and recognize them at their schools. The winner will be announced in the spring. Board members, this concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. I remember years ago registering my, my oldest for kindergarten and thinking, 2017 is so far away. And so we're registering students for 2034. Is <laughs> okay, parents, register those kindergartners. Let's get them started. And that brings us to policies for review. Mrs. Morris. Good evening, everyone. You have several policies for your review tonight at, that were part of our regular review of policies, and they've gone to the uh, policy committee. Um, and then there are two administrative guidelines for your review as well. If you have any questions, I can try and help through those today. Will those administrative guidelines become effective tomorrow and be pushed out, or do they come back next month? Uh, administrative guidelines come to the board just for review one time, so they would become effective immediately upon the review tonight. Okay. I was wondering because it, it affects, uh, there's a grading practices and stuff like that, so it would be imp important to get it out as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Do any board members not in the policy committee have any questions upon review? Um, Madam Chairman, I have some uh, not more really questions but concerns regarding the grading practices and I had an opportunity to print off a copy and view part of the uh, discussion debate what, what have you of the uh, policy committee um, I have some concerns well really about both parts as far as putting in administrative guidelines uh, that a student will not be penalized for an assignment four days after the due date and part of my concern is, um, I understand in elementary and middle, I don't think that's an issue. We're in strange day and times and flexibility is important. But particularly in high school, I think this is going to present a quite a burden on our teachers. If you think about it, you're assigning a due date, but really it's more like a due window. You have four days after that due date that the teacher is going to need to be track who's turning in what. Plus, if it's a test or a quiz or important work, the teacher really can't discuss that with the class until the window has closed because you basically begin the answers to the kids who haven't done the work yet. So that means four days from the due date, they're dropping back to review the information or go over the answers or go over the uh, uh, text after they moved on to something else. Uh, I also think it sets uh, a president that, you know, we've, we've been very uh, philosophical about uh, putting too much of uh, what some might call micromanagement on our, our principals and, and teachers and giving them the flexibility do what you, you know, makes sense. And I think that's really the intent of this guideline is because of the times, we understand there are certain circumstances. Now, uh, I don't think just because I'm not at home that night with a high schooler, I don't think I'm going to be able to help with a whole lot of subjects anyway, maybe history, but I understand on the elementary and middle. But uh, I'm concerned about um, creating a, almost a, uh, idea or, or an, uh, poss a possibility that, yeah, it's due today, but I got four more days to do it if I want to. And that kind of 
academic rigor is not going to cut it in college. When it's due, it's due, or even at the junior college. So I'm not sure, particularly on the high school level, that we're sending the right message to our students. And I would like to see, or I, and I would ask, what input on this administrative guideline has been given for from teachers and principals um, and their thoughts on this. And I, I think we can communicate with all our players that this is our intent without actually nailing it to a four-day number and giving, giving the leeway that's appropriate in this day and time, but not go to a, a hard number. I also have concerns with the grade below 50. Dr. Hohan was nice enough to relay some of the um, thought process behind that. And I understand that could uh, significantly impair a student that was totally off that grading period to be able to recover if their grade was significantly below 50. Um, again, I'm just concerned that uh, we are lowering the bar in that um, 50 is basically the new starting starting place if you are truly not doing the work. And so I, I'm concerned about the message that sends as well. And, and Dr. Julian, if you just want to address um, – other than the policy committee, the other input that you received on these and from our actual, from our educators and what the response, what the response was. Well, as the chair of policy for the last two years, I would like to begin since that was the committee I led. So we've been having this discussion for many, many months, and I would have appreciated some of your input before tonight. But what I will say is that we first off, this administration guideline is just for during COVID, just for now. It is not a permanent grading practice. It is a COVID-19 grading guideline because younger students whose parents are working may not have their grandparents or their babysitter may not be able to help them with their assignment. I was I was receiving complaints that their child did not get the, the, the teacher said the assignment was due at three. The student was having computer problems with the sitter. They got the assignment uploaded a few minutes late because they were having internet issues and the teacher gave them zeros. And so the parents were still at work and could not help this little second grader and their child got zeros. So I will say that the conversations we've had for several months in the policy committee is that there is a significant increase in depression, anxiety among our parents and our students over this remote learning on the days that our students cannot have a teacher help them with their assignments. And so we, we wanted to be able to offer this. The other, the other phone calls that I have received are from our high school students. Our high school students whose parents have lost their job and have gone outside of the home and are taking part-time and full-time jobs to help their moms and dads get the bills paid and put food on the table we have a significant amount of teenagers who are having to work and may or may not be able to jump online every time they have a class change and they need that flexibility to get their assignments turned in. So those are the conversations we had about our younger students that need assistance and our teenage students who are caring for grandparents great-grandparents, and, and having to work during this difficult time, we've, we had discussed a four-day flexibility grace period for these students to not receive zeros, that if they made the effort to try and learn the content that is required for their promotion, 
that we would show them grace and mercy and understanding during this remote learning COVID experience. So I'll just I'll turn it over, Dr. Hillhan. This was not a permanent grading practice, only while we were on COVID-19. I think I think Ms. Merrill summed that up very well. I don't know how much I have to add other than uh, under Dr. Breedlove's leadership, we do have an internal grading committee that's composed of principals, teachers, et cetera, that did review um, this administrative guideline and gave feedback on this. Uh, it's my understanding that they did meet to discuss this several times for the last couple of months. So um, I don't think there's anything else for me to say other than, you know, we're in a completely flipped up world right now. And grace and flexibility are the two words we've continued to use and feel that it might be in the best interest of students uh, to have this grace period during the during the current semester. I, I uh, certainly understand. I don't want to get the wrong impression on elementary, particularly. I understand the situation. Parents may not be able to provide the assistance right away when the child needs it in middle school to some extent. Uh, my personal experience with my middle school son is all of his teachers uh, have been more than accommodating during uh, a time of, of quarantine and, and other issues to uh, accommodate his needs to, to finish work around obstacles that many of our families are facing. I, again, my concerns are to put an actual number to it. I think it should be our it should be an unspoken policy, if you will, that we need to be flexible with all our students to try and accommodate them in these unusual times. So I will just, uh, I'll leave it at that with my concerns. I do agree with you, Mr. Sides, that it should be an unspoken um, policy with all of our teachers to, sh to work with our students, especially those that are working or their parents are not there to help them if they have a question or an internet problem. But I cannot tell you how many parents or grandparents have reached out to me because their children got it in a few minutes late and got zeros. And so I, I'm extremely happy to hear that your son, you know, your teacher, his teachers are working with your son, but unfortunately that is not the phone calls I've been, I've been getting, you know, this semester, kids are getting zeros and not being allowed to learn the content, do the content and do, do the exercise. And, and so like when you have work, the other, uh, other phone calls that I've gotten aside from zeros, when the student wanted to do the work and we're talking about like second and third graders, very young children here, their parents want to work with them on the weekends to make sure they're caught up. Working parents, you know, use their weekends to look at Canvas, to look at PowerSchool and verify, did my, did my son or daughter get all of their assignments done this week? And unfortunately, that's how a lot of our families are spending their weekend right now is working with their student because they can't do it Monday through Friday because they're working outside the home or they're working all throughout the night in emergency rooms. And so they dedicate the weekend to making sure that their, their children have done their, their work for the week. I, and, I understand that happens every night at our house. I want to blow the whistle on my son, but that's, that's the, an ongoing it's, project. But the challenge for us is that there were teachers given zeros. Mm -hmm. I mean, children, you know, were having, you know, problems with their iPad at home, problems mm -hmm. with their Chromebook at home. Mama wasn't there to help. Daddy wasn't there to help. Grandma didn't know how to fix it. And their child got zeros. Let me ask you, in those instances, I'm sure you referred them back to the principal of the school, and were they able to get some kind of uh, accommodation when you brought it to whoever's attention? I mean, they're calling you. The teacher said assume. it was her policy, and she had told everyone in the class that day it had to be turned in by 3 p.m. And so when the parents got home, the child was in tears. They had zeros for everything. 
So well, let, let me just reiterate, if this issue comes up again, with the, even with the four-day um, leeway, parents should reach out to the principal immediately, then, well, the next day, and bring that to, would that not be appropriate to bring to the opinion uh, if, if a parent is a teacher is not, you know, doing their best to accommodate. And Mr. Sods, would you like to make a motion? I would, can I say something first, Mrs. Yeah. Merrill? The, the point of this was consistency. It's awesome that your child's teacher is doing that, but it is not happening across the district. So everything that's in the online instruction and grading practices is about consistency across the district. And honestly, and I, I, I had hoped I had hoped that it would have been an unspoken guideline during the fall, but because we were getting so many inconsistencies from school to school and so many children and parents were in tears because their children were failing, that's why we wanted it in writing this semester. Because grace didn't work last semester. Okay, well, understand we're going down the road of we're setting a, a, a system-wide rule here where in the past we have been frankly resistant to do that and left it more in the responsibility of the principal for taking care that everybody's on board with the program. And this is what I would consider anyway, a break towards now we're doing a rule, well, elementary, middle, and high. So this is more of the, we're telling everybody how it is versus a, you know, your school needs to be on board with the concept of what we're trying to do here. I just want to bring that to the attention, everybody, that we're going down that road of setting. A temporary rule during COVID-19. I hope we're not always under COVID-19, but this. So does this guideline automatically expire after the end of the 2021 academic year? The provision regarding the the four days is specific to the 2021 school year. Okay, right. okay right. Mr. Benchen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, my question, it doesn't seem like the four days is uh, arbitrary. And I guess uh, Dr. Hulihan or Dr. Abrilo can address this. Was the four days uh, grace period, if we call it, uh, came up because you saw that Within four days of your own research, most of this stuff was getting kind of done. So you just kind of put a hard stop with that four days. Is that kind you know, the data kind of showed that over a four day course, let's just say on average, after a deadline was given within that time period, reasonably speaking, of course, uh, the work was being uh, accomplished. That is uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the other answer to that is, as the board is aware, we also have the ability to count children present from an attendance standpoint within a four-day window. And so that that simultaneous coupling of that rule around work being submitted and attendance counting um, was uh, the other part of the process. So, yes. Okay. Because uh, it just didn't seem like it was just arbitrarily yeah, arbitrary, right. came to it just seemed like there was some data there. I think there. it was from the um, being absent and missed work when mm -hmm. you're out sick. So there was already a four day window around that. And I, that's where it came from. But to Mr. G Ms., uh, to Gary's point, uh, we probably need to have a hard stop on this, like a, like a hard stop because he is absolutely right. We don't want to be known as a district that just allows, it ends, yeah. you know, I so we need to have a hard COVID stop. It would, it will expire on the last day of instruction. And if we are in any situation that re that requires this in the future, because we're still in a pandemic, we will bring this back to the board policy committee for review if needed. I'm happy. Now, now does the second part about the minimum 50 grade, I don't see just looking through this real quick. Does this have a sunset at the end of this school year as well? No, the only provision that has a sunset is the four-day grading period. I have a okay. question. Hasn't the 50 and below been around for a while? This is not new. Correct, Dr. Breedlove. It has been around. This is not new. We just put it in a in an administrative guideline. It's existed 
before. The other question, uh, Mr. Side, you implied that um, Dr. Houlihan got complaints. Is that true? Complaints about what? About oh, no, I was asking basically where, who else he, he consulted or whose input was given as, as part oh. of this process. Okay. I, I didn't. Have we didn't. had complaints from principals about this? I have not received any complaints, no. Dr. Breedlove, did you work with the principals or get any input? Um, we had a, a, a committee. I thought I heard that. Yeah, committee. Sorry. Maybe Dr. Breedlove can speak to the um, process when it left policy. The original um, guidelines were developed um, by principals, by, I believe there are some teachers on that grading committee. Um, we've had that for now probably a year or longer. And uh, so, the, yes, the original uh, guidelines were uh, developed in conjunction with that, that committee. And it's been discussed in policy for months. Um, and nothing was really improving from the fall and we were still getting complaints. And so we put it in writing for this semester. Any other board members have any concerns or questions? Okay, and so this, um, the administrative guidelines will go into effect tomorrow and policy A, B, and C will come back next month. Ms. Morris? That's correct. Okay. Is everybody good with that? May, may I add, offer an amendment to the grading practices under part two, standard operating procedures for assigning failing grades and add uh, the, basically to the effect that this would also be effective for the 2021 academic year. In other words, the second part will also sunset at policy. the end of this year. The whole the administrative whole. guideline. Exactly. Which, basically. I, we can bring it back if we want for next year. I'm, I'm good with that. Dr. Breedlove, is that okay with you? Can you live with that? Okay. If, if that's the case, I'll second it. Well, we didn't have a motion. Oh, I thought you was making a motion. Yeah. You don't need a motion. You know, it's an administrative okay. guideline. So. so just what I will say is we, we hear the feedback. We can make the change. And at, according to the policy committee, moving forward, we can bring this back for review mm -hmm. with the denoted change for the future. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Okay. Outstanding. Wait, ho hold on. So this is not going to go into effect tomorrow. You're going to change it. Amend no. it and then bring it back again. No. no, what I'm saying is based on your comment and the board's discussion, that's that other piece about sunsetting the whole guideline mm -hmm. at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. We can clarify that in the document and make sure the policy committee and full board see that clarification. So as off we after, train after principals and teachers on this, we're not bringing it back. No, right. right. As okay. as we train individuals that are implementing these guidelines, they will know what the what the sunsetting is. That's excellent. But we've had three board members discussing this. Should we not put it to a vote to make sure we have consensus here? So this um, comes to the board tonight from the policy committee 3-0. So it does not require a second. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? One. So the um, motion passes 7-1. I'm sorry, can I just get clarification? Is the motion that they don't sense sunset at the end of the school year? No, they do. It was, I said as amended. I don't know if you heard that. I'm sorry, so. I didn't. So I'm going to add a sentence at the very end that says these guidelines will be in effect for the 2021 academic year only. I like that. Thank you. I like that. Oh, you earned, you earned all your money tonight. <laughs> you earned all Why, your money thank tonight. You. <laughs> This is not intended as a permanent guideline. I just want to assure everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, that brings us to board comments. Madam Chair, I'd like to offer some comments tonight. 
Um, I love Union County. <laughs> I love this county. This this county is my uh, adopted hometown. Monroe, of course, is my adopted city. I love the citizens of this county. But that doesn't mean that the good reverend doesn't at times get a little hot under the collar. We have a chair of our board that has had some words said about her that were very, very disrespectful and harmful. I believe that when certain words are used, they're not used in a proper context and for good reason. They lose their effect. They are not effective words at that point. Our chair over the, I remember when I believe she first ran in 2014, we were out there in the rain, in the cold. I didn't prevail that year as a district one candidate to hold that seat, but she did. And she was so happy to become a board member on the Union County, North Carolina Board of Education. I've come to know her and some watch these things and know that uh, we don't always agree and consensus is not mandatory. But she is a woman of honor, of high integrity, and she loves all children. All. There is no color di uh, difference in who she loves. She loves all Union County children. And all you have to do is to follow her. As the chair, you may not know this, but she attends most every committee meeting, whether she's on that committee or not. She's our liaison, her and the vice chair with our County Board of Education. She works tirelessly for this county. She extends sacrifices of her own family down through the years that she's been on this board. So I would just like to say in the kindest way that I know how, you may want to reconsider your words when speaking about our chair, Miss Melissa Merrill. And if you have qualms with her, she's easy to reach. She'll be more than happy to sit down with you over a cup of coffee and talk about the educational processes of Union County Public Schools. But I really wish that those of you out there, and you know who you are, that you would cease and desist the unkind words those racist words, those words that speak to her as if she's some kind of ogre. She's a kind lady, a wife, a mother, school board member. She's our chair, and I stand behind our chair 100%. So I just want to say to you, Get to know her and stop the madness. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Reverend Benchin. That was very kind. I, I would also like to echo those comments. Uh, we receive a lot of emails, and some are very um, professional, questioning how we come to certain decisions, uh, offering information that they think we may not be aware of. But frankly, I have no respect 
for anyone that submits a distasteful, um, mean, bigoted email and then has the low rent to make it anonymous and cover their tracks. If you got something to say, there's the podium. You can say it. Here's my email. You can send it and I'll answer it and have the, the best I can or get you to the place where it needs to be. But personal attacks upon anyone because I know them all sitting at this table and they honestly have the best interests of our students and our staff at heart. And to question that, you can question what we do, but don't question our motives. And if you don't like that response, you are welcome to run to sit at one of these tables. Okay? Because until you do, you may not be able to fully grasp the responsibilities, even in a non-COVID crazy time that issues that we have to deal with from budgets beyond our control, redistricting because houses are going up everywhere and state laws and requirements changing and we have to cope. So it's real easy to get on social media or do anonymous, hateful emails, but I frankly have no respect for someone that chooses that Avenue to try and get their point across. Uh, Number number two item, I'll switch gears a little bit. This Thursday, I believe it is, the State Board of Education will be voting on some significant curriculum changes that will affect students across this state. Uh, one entails the addition of a financial literacy requirement. I call it that. That may not be the exact name. And I truly support that requirement. Uh, being able to learn about credit, loans, how to apply for a job, and other aspects of your financial well-being are very important. But as part of that, one of our social studies requirement semesters will be eliminated. And recent studies that I've looked at, the actual literacy, civics literacy, if you will, of our students is diminishing. Uh, I would challenge seniors in our high schools to take the same exam required of legal immigrants looking to become a U.S. citizen and see what percentage of them can pass it. So in this change, that will even eliminate part of that. So I would like, I will hope to pursue fulfilling that requirement again locally if that's, that's possible to do. And third and final, I wanted to address the speakers, the heartfelt speakers that were uh, that came tonight to talk about the lottery at Cata. Uh, I understand it is a matter of economics. It's the su supply and demand. We have classes that are in higher demand than there is a supply. And I, I am hopeful. I've talked to Dr. Breedlove about studying data from this current lottery and past lotteries and our capacity at CATA from a teacher and, and a classroom standpoint and what, if anything, we can do to uh, meet that demand. CATA is a beautiful facility. It's a wonderful facility. Um, and it fills a very important need in, in many of the curriculum offered there. And I would hope that one day we won't have to have lotteries because there will be a spot for everyone that is capable and has a desire to be part of the specialized curriculum at CATA. And uh, I, I hope that will come to fruition one day. And with that, I wish everyone a good evening. I, just to be clear about the CATA um, lottery, and this is um, Morris, you can jump in. It's a, a, it's a transfer from a student who's outside of the district. It's a transfer request to come into the district, which is why that UCPS students are first and then everybody else. There's still a chance that students from other schools, if a, if a academy isn't full, it, we are not saying that they cannot go to CATA. It's just a... a, a 
a ranking of students that are applying. Is that a way to say it? Yes, ma'am. That's consistent with other districts and their magnet programs. Right. And I, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Um, in the big districts, um, the magnet schools, only students that are enrolled in the district can apply to magnet schools. So it's no difference than that. And I, I would say I have nothing. It, it's about charter schools or anything else, but charter schools have lotteries too. And they also have um, priority for families or siblings and things like that. It's no, it's not that much different than what we're doing. It's difficult to have transfers when, you know, transfer appeals, they have to be a student of Union County Public Schools. But a big district, the other big districts in this, in North Carolina, you have to be an, uh, an, uh, enrolled in that district to apply for a magnet school. So I just want to clarify all UA charter school students that want to apply to CATA can apply to CATA, correct? That's correct. Okay. And it's also my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, but don't a lot of the programs interview applicants and then the different heads of, of the different programs select the top applicants and or, or not? That's auditions. I think the, auditions. I'm I thinking think the about auditions. I think the performing arts um, and there's one other and I can't remember, Dr. Breedlove. Because I, I know some families where their their student had to go in and apply. They do, or I'm do sorry, auditions. interview, interview. They, yeah, they do auditions. Correct. So I'm a little I'm a little confused by the speakers tonight because it was almost under the impression that they aren't allowed to apply. And I just want to clarify: any student in Union Camp, any rising ninth grader in Union County can apply to CATA. You can go in for the interviews, the auditions, and I believe that if, if you're one of the top applicants, you'll get one of the slots in the lottery. The lottery will be run for Union County Public Schools current students uh -huh. first. Okay. And then the additional spots will be available for non-Union County Public School students. Okay. All students can apply. Correct. Okay. Correct. Are there any other board comments? If there aren't, I would like to move to announcements and I would like to um, take the lead on announcements. It is my sad duty as the board chair to announce the resignation of our dear colleague, Ms. Candace Sturdivant. For District 1. I want to notify the board that I have been in constant communication with Ms. Sturdivant over the, over the last several months. And on Friday, January 22nd, she and I met face to face and she gave me her verbal re resignation. And last week, she submitted her written follow up which I forwarded to each of you, Dr. Houlihan and Mrs. Morris, on January 28th. Mrs. Sturdivant says, it saddens me to share that unfortunately I will need to resign from Union County Public Schools Board of Education due to an unexpected health crisis. It has been a deep honor for Mrs. Sturdivant to serve as the voted school board member for District 1. She says that I am forever grateful for the opportunity to have a voice within committees for our wonderful students and their parents, as well as our amazing teachers, staff, and administrators. Thank you for allowing me to serve with Union County and believing in my sincere leadership and mentorship. She goes on to say, as, that, as I have shared with others and others have shared with me, we must continue to love one another and treat each other 
as we would like to be treated. Take one day at a time as tomorrow is not promised. And Mrs. Sturdivant says, I love each of you. Mrs. Sturdivant was elected in 2016. She was re-elected this past November 2020. She has dutifully served for four years on our policy committee, our curriculum committee, and as the District 1 representative, she always awarded the John H. Crowder Service Award, which was a huge honor for her. And she has also served on the Student Health Advisory Committee. And her one last comment that she messaged me um, before I got in the car to come here tonight, I just want to make sure um, she wanted to make sure that everyone here and watching at home that has that worked so hard for Union County Public Schools that she sit, shares her sincerest, deepest gratitude to have been part of this school district. And I just want to say that I did share with Mrs. Sturdivant on the 22nd that once she is well, we look forward to her um, rolling up her sleeves and and helping out more in Union County Public Schools in other ways. And um, it was um, a very difficult to accept her resignation because I know in her heart it was the last thing she wanted to do. But I think, I think she will absolutely continue to serve in our community. And I just want to say thank you to Mrs. Sturdivant for being one of us for the last four years. So Mrs. Morris has already reached out to the Board of Elections to notify um, so that the Democrat Party can be notified so that they can begin their process on filling the District 1 seat until 2022, I believe is that. So um, we will await their, um, their appointment, and, um, but I'm sure everyone um, will, you know, please keep Mrs. Sturdivant in your thoughts and prayers. I know many of you have already, already reached out to her. The last announcement I have is I have received a letter from the Union County Board of Commission Commissioners, Mr. Richard Helms, asking that our board, in preparation for our budget um, planning that is um, underway, if you would please make a note, um, they, they would like to have a joint meeting on Thursday, March 18th at 6 p.m. at the Union County Ag Center. So if everyone would please look at their calendars and let Kathy and I know your availability for March 18th that evening and your ability to get out to the Ag Center. Um, once we hear back from you, Kathy and I will confirm that joint meeting. Okay. And board members, any other announcements? We'll be a facilities committee meeting on February 18th at 7 at uh, 7, 9 a.m., <laughs> and a finance committee on February 23rd at 9 a.m. by Zoom, but could be subject to change. The Strategic Planning, Technology, and Transportation Committee will be meeting on Wednesday, February 24th at 7.30 here at the, the PDC. The Policy Committee will meet February 24th, 9 o'clock. Right now it's set for Zoom. Mrs. Hindtail, when did you say facilities would be? The 18th. The 18th. So, Dr. Breedlove, um, would you like to have curriculum on the 18th at 11 a.m.? Okay, very good. 
Are there any more announcements? Seeing none, I will accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, board. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you.